Hello and welcome to the Null Channel. Now, as many of you know, we talk all things computer science here, and today I'm bringing to you probably my most controversial topic to date. Now, I have heard, and I mean I hear it a lot, that Kubernetes has a developer experience problem. It's just too hard for developers to understand and too difficult to make an application that runs on Kubernetes. But I don't think that's the issue at all. In fact, I'm going to argue that Kubernetes has actually helped make the developer experience easier and not hurt it. Now, if you think I'm saying this for the views, trust me, I'm not. Well, I am making this video for you to view, but I'm terrible at clickbait. But I'm happy for you to disagree to me. Just listen to my argument and then let me know where you think I went wrong in the comments and join the Discord to talk about it. Maybe you will change my mind and I would release a follow-up video. So I have heard it time and time again, Kubernetes is too difficult for developers. I have even argued along these same lines and that you should have a team that understands and abstracts Kubernetes away from your developers. And I still kind of do, but my perspective has changed just a little bit. But in the end, I think that I've added to this misconception and for that, I'm sorry. What I want to talk about is the real issue. What is really causing issues for developers? Because again, I don't think it's Kubernetes at all. If it's not Kubernetes, what could it be? Why do we consider Kubernetes to be difficult in the first place? It, is it because it has services? I, I don't think so. Services are just effectively load balancers and are a pretty common concept. Well then, is it the concept of a pod? Well, that can't be right because a pod is really just kind of like a VM, a collection of processes running. Then is it the containers? I, I find this really hard to believe as containers are just a version two, or maybe a version three of Truth, a way to isolate a process. All of these things are kind of simple and using any one of them is simple and causes no developer any issue at all. I struggle to see how these things as a whole cause people trouble. So it must be the networks that makes Kubernetes too difficult. But again, this can't be. Kubernetes networks are just standard networks, right? There is really nothing special about them. In fact, they don't even support NATing or anything complicated like that and are really simple networks. Wait, wait, wait. I know. I know. It's labels. The ability to label arbitrary things with labels is just super confusing. I'm joking, by the way. So what is it? If Kubernetes is just a scheduler, all it does is schedule workloads to run on different machines, a concept so simple my six-year-old understands it. Hey Mari, could you help me explain what Kubernetes is to my viewers? Sure, it's easy. Pretend that each of these boxes is a computer. And these are apps. Those are our apps? Mm -hmm. And you can orchestrate, Kubernetes can help you orchestrate these to the, the computers. So Kubernetes is gonna help us orchestrate each of our apps on the different computers. What if we have three apps? Is it gonna be able to do it on all three computers? Yeah, Kubernetes can orchestrate it, that app to that one, and this one, and this one. Well, thank you very much, nice job. So again, I ask, if it's not Kubernetes, if Kubernetes is not causing developers any issues, what is it? Because I don't see how a scheduler of containers or pods causes developers any issues. It's simple really, and some of you might know where I'm headed with this. It's the same issue that causes a thing like Kubernetes to be a thing in the first place. Kubernetes is trying to solve part of the issue. Let's start with a little bit of history to better understand the problem and why we are here, and then we can wrap up why Kubernetes does not have a developer issue. In the early infancy of the internet, people connected their computers to the internet via their phones and called other computers. These were just individual computers talking on the phone line with each other, just like someone, uh, someone right now might. And this worked well. 
But then, in December 5th, 1994, the Netscape Communication Corporation released Mosaic, and then later changed it to Netscape Navigator when they were sued by the NCSA Mosaic Project. Anyhow, the web was kind of brought to the general public at this time. And while this is not a history lesson or me saying that Netscape made the internet, because I'm by far not saying that, I'm trying to lay the groundwork for the big issue at hand. My point here is that the internet exploded in popularity, from the small group of zealots sharing flash animations of a dude with no arms and dragons with beefy arms, to watching this video right here today. And likely, at this point, most of your content you consume, whether it's blogs or TV, movies, or shopping, is done via the internet. But wait, Merrick, what does this have to do with Kubernetes and developers' problems with Kubernetes? Wait, stop it. Remember, developers don't have a problem with Kubernetes. Let me tell you my story, I promise it is going to make sense in the end as to why Kubernetes does not have a developer experience issue. So now, everything from your video content, your shopping, your dating, and social interactions, and don't even get me started on TikTok, it's all on the internet. And these applications are huge. And I mean massive beyond your or even my comprehension. YouTube, for example, back in 2018, stated that one petabyte of data was uploaded to it every single day. Uploaded. And this is only increasing. And this does not count the streamed data. Think if each video got viewed an average of, let's say, 10 times. That would be 10 petabytes of data in egress. And that's just counting the new content. Think about the computation to required to encode that one petabyte of new video. Each 4K video gets transcoded into a plethora of other uh, versions from 720 to 1080 and 4K. And this happens for every video that gets uploaded. They not only have the network to upload one petabyte of data, at close to 100 uh, gigabytes, a second, and I, I'm talking about gigabytes per second, so roughly 105 Google Fiber download connections would be needed just to ingest the data onto YouTube's network, assuming it's all uploaded evenly over a 24-hour period. More likely, they have a much larger ingestion pipeline to handle spikes and days that uploads are more than other days, as one petabyte is the average. You might be asking, what is my point here? My point is, there is no server, no computer, no network switch large enough to serve YouTube. Not only that, but if YouTube was on a single server in a single region of the world, it would have poor fault tolerance, it would only need to have a single computer die or power outage or network failure to bring down the entire service. But it would also be slow for anyone that was not geographically close to it. And this is mainly due to the limiting factor of the speed of light. What is the solution to this? How does YouTube solve this? That's right, a stateless application that you can run anywhere. You'll need a way to distribute the data and computation across the world, so not only is it resilient to fault, but also allows quick access to locals. And now you have hundreds, if not thousands, of these applications running on servers around the world. You need some way to keep track of when and where it's all running. And, and this is not even why we have Kubernetes. You might have jumped to say Kubernetes helps solve this, and I think I would disagree with you in general. You could leverage Kubernetes here for sure, but this is not where it shines, nor do I think it really helps here. So let's keep going, let's dig just a little deeper. We will keep talking about the YouTube in our examples just to keep everything uh, fluid. If it was a single application, it would be a huge application. I mean, really huge, with thousands of engineers working on it, everything from the recommendation engine, uh, account management, billing, search, data storage, data ingestion, transcoding, that really super strict moderation engine that keeps flagging my videos, comments, playlists, ads, uh, and, and so much more would all be part of a single application, a single code base with a mess of interdependencies. This would be slow. 
not the application. The application would probably be faster than the current service, but slow to develop on as the code base would be so large with so many people touching it. It would be complicated and prone to error, as changing a single thing in one part could have unintended consequences in a completely separate part of the application. I like to call this the butterfly effect of large code bases. So what does YouTube do to combat this? How do they keep teams working without being blocked by other teams? How do they keep the code base small and manageable? How do they ensure that if ingestion spikes, they are able to handle it? YouTube breaks their engineers into smaller teams, and each team owns their own small application that does a thing. Each application hopefully has no dependencies on another application, nor any relation. No dependencies on one another and any of the other applications. If they do need information from one of these other services or applications, they should talk in a way that is a well-defined API that can be deprecated and updated in the future. Is any of this starting to sound familiar? Now, I think almost every engineer watching might understand where I'm going with this. Microservices have a developer experience issue, not Kubernetes. Kubernetes is Google's attempt to help with the scheduling issues of microservices, but it's not the full answer. Kubernetes is not a developer's tool in the first place. Yeah, you all know I love Kubernetes, but stop trying to make it things that it's not. Tools should focus on doing one thing and doing it well. Kubernetes should look to solve the scheduling issue really well. Anything above and beyond that should be another tool. So solving the developer experience of microservices does not really seem to be a Kubernetes issue at all. Now, if you don't believe me about microservices, really, I'm a little hurt. But microservices are really hard. Come on, let, let's be real. Like, please, how do you test the whole system? How do you test if your service serves its purpose as part of a whole? How do you ensure that your service does not get broken by another service giving it garbage data? And these are the easy issues of microservices. Let's talk about making an event-driven architecture. This is really important if you ever wanna track down an issue as knowing what service actually handled the call or the request and the entire call chain can become increasingly complicated. Not only that, do you wanna know what user made the original call four or five microservices deep? Unless if you have a perfectly defined requirement for each microservice made, making a change can become painful as it could have dependencies on other teams giving you new endpoints first with new information. Now, if you want to expose any piece of data, you have to make a well-defined API and you have to support it for a while, even if you have a good deprecation policy. In theory, local development of microservices can be really, really easy, but as we found out, theory is never the same thing as true. What is the answer to all of this then? What is the solution? Well, I don't think there is a good general purpose solution to the microservice issue yet. There are projects out there that actively try to solve this, and there are architectures that are viable that are not microservice architectures. And this is where you as engineers need to understand the problems and the business requirements that you have and pick the best tool for the job. If any of you just say, we will use a microservice architecture because that's the right one without understanding your issue, without understanding your workforce and your business requirements, you are not doing your job as a software engineer. If we hop back to Google's YouTube example, they have found a microservice solution that works for them. They have a team or two, or, or maybe even hundreds of teams of smart engineers working to make the microservice experience better, to help with the management, uh, deployment, and development of their microservices. Their entire job of these engineers is not to deploy or build something that end users will use, but it is to empower the other engineers that are building stuff for the end users. There are a lot of techniques you can use. You can have a system that records events and, and let engineers replay those events through their microservices to test and develop their services. But this takes a whole lot of work, like 
I mean, a whole lot of work. You can also set up environments that have almost the same as production that developers can run their local application in. But again, all of this stuff, it takes a lot of work to do well. There is no simple solution to this. There is no easy button, and Kubernetes is really not the answer. Its job is to schedule stuff. If your developers have an issue scheduling stuff, Kubernetes will solve it. It's not to deal with your architecture design decisions. Now, all is not lost. There is a new hope, and that new hope is you. I make these videos to help you leverage technologies to solve your problems. And I honestly think that microservices have become a problem. Too often, people either think they are doing microservices and are actually doing microliths, you can check out that video, or are actually doing microservices when there is a better choice for their situation, their data, their use case, or their business needs. Part of the problem is that you can't say anything bad about microservices without getting canceled. YouTube has already removed ads from this video due to fake news, and I got downvotes before I even posted the video. But for real, I don't have a problem with microservices. I just think that you need to know what problem they solve, and you need to know when you have that problem, and that you need to solve that problem. And until you have that problem, you want to wait to solve it. You have other problems to solve right now. I guess my statement is tread lightly into the darkness that is microservices, and only dare tread there if you know what and why you are doing it. Microservices have a developer experience issue. Microservices are hard to do right, and microservices have a lot of their own downfalls. I don't say this to say that they are bad, I say this because I too often see things go wrong when teams don't understand what and why they are doing something. And let me reiterate, I love Kubernetes and I love microservices. But do you know what will let us leverage Kubernetes most effectively? By understanding what it does, what problem it solves, and why you would use it is the most par important part. Knowing when you have the problem and knowing what technique or technology to use to solve the current business needs is seven-eighths of the problem. Everything after that is simple. If you're using Kubernetes to solve your developer experience problems with microservices, you're using the tool incorrectly. So go out into the world, spread the good news. Kubernetes does not have a developer issue. Your architecture might have a developer issue. But if you did not like this video and do not enjoy learning why Kubernetes does not have a microservice problem, go ahead, hit that like button, subscribe, stick around, and don't learn about why microservices are difficult for small development teams. Really nice job. And sneak attack! <laughs>